Thank you so much for joining me today on Just Praise Him Radio. I'm your host, Linda Lomax, and my job is to inspire you to a closer walk with Christ. Now here's the show. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Just Praise Him radio program. I'm your host, Linda Lomax, and the title of my message today is Getting Through Now. I was thinking about what all you most could, you know, use this week in the way of a podcast, and I realized that everybody I know is thinking about the same things. We all see the handwriting on the wall, and we see how everything is lining up against us as Christians, and we don't know how bad conditions are going to get before we're taken home, but we hope not bad, right? And we all want to put in a good show for the Lord's glory, but we sometimes don't feel all that brave right now. In fact, if we are honest, we sometimes have to beat back fear to keep standing in faith. And we don't know what to do. I don't think anything could have prepared us for the insanity of the world we live in right now. I never dreamed I would live in this time. I'm sure you didn't either. First, there was the pandemic, which was bad enough in itself. I mean, none of us really want to catch a killer virus, right? Then our election in America turned into a complete circus. And now our government is running a let's see who's going to resist the mark when we bring it out program. So, yes, we're having a pretty tough time of it here in the state. So I thought it would be good if we just talked about that on this podcast. And I know that you guys in other countries are also having a tough time. We're not ignoring you there. So, you know, as far as fear of the end times, we all know there's a famine coming. We know that hyperinflation is probably going to beat the famine here. It sure looks like it. I mean, gas increased by 10 cents a gallon in the last week, y'all. I've never seen that before. I think there is less fear if you develop faith for your provision. We just, we feel less afraid, right? As humans... When we are afraid, uh, we tend to seek comfort. That's our natural human response. But unfortunately, we often seek it in the wrong places. So that's not a good thing. What's coming down the pike is not pretty. But what if we concentrate instead on what reaction the Lord wants us to give? We are quickly approaching the time of the mark of the beast. I believe what is happening now is the test pilot if you will, for that, to see who will go with and who will go against and what works to push through the plan, okay? Revelation thirteen sixteen, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And 17. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Okay. So knowing that, what do we do? Well, we know we cannot take the mark when it does come out, and the pressure will be very great. You will not be able to buy anything, food, gasoline, etc. I pulled into a Sonic drive-in yesterday to get a Diet Coke, and as I sat there looking at the menu, I thought about that, and I thought, wow, when the mark comes out, all of us Christians will just be able to look on. We won't be able to buy anything to eat or drink here. But the mark is coming. We cannot do anything about that. But you remember this, because I would be remiss if I did not tell you this. If you do take the mark, you cannot repent for it later, and you cannot get into heaven no matter what you do after that or how sorry you are for taking it. Please hear me on this. Understand that and do not listen to the deceptive teachings out there. How we know this is by the word of God. In Revelation chapter 14, the very last book of the Bible, in verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, that means pure wrath, into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. 
verse 11, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receives the mark of his name. It is in black and white. Read your Bibles, Revelation chapter 14. If you do not believe what I'm telling you, you should always check what you hear when you are listening to sermons, if you have any doubt whatsoever. Make sure that what you're hearing is the truth. But that's in black and white. You cannot mistake what it says. There's not a second way to take that. And anyone who teaches you different is wrong, y'all. I'm sorry, but they're wrong. We are in a time when we are being forced to choose God again and again and again. He has told us this. We are going to have to choose him over and over and over. These are not going to be easy choices, but we can make them. He chose us for this time. That's how we know that. There are people who are going around saying the current shot is the mark. It cannot be the mark. Look at what the word of God says. Go back to... Revelation 14, 9, and he received the mark in his forehead or in his hand. Those are not given in the forehead or the hand. The shot is not the mark. It's a precursor or conditioning for the mark is what it is. Revelation nineteen twenty, and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And, you know, if you look on the internet, you will find that it takes quite a high temperature for brimstone, which is an actual stone, to catch fire. So, there are terrible events coming. There is no question about that. But, y'all, there were always terrible events coming in every age. No matter what time you lived in, terrible events came. We cannot spend all our time and energy sitting around worrying about all of that because it has to happen in order for Jesus to come back and get us. And we want him to come back and get us, right? We want to go home. I want to take all the people I love with me, but I do want to go home. What is happening now here in America, and we know in other countries y'all are going through a lot too, is less than pleasant. But we are still here. And if we are still here, then we have something to do for the kingdom of God. Let's all get our work done so we can go home and have coffee together. Okay, now, we all know there are times of lack coming. I personally have been sowing more into the kingdom with that in mind. Because let me tell you what. Our mighty Father in heaven is not subject to earthly recessions. Can I just say that? He is not subject to any earthly recession or economic turn. He owns all the cattle and all the gold on a thousand hills, and we are his kids. So let's talk about what to do if we see a time of lack coming, or if we find ourselves in lack. And we all need to know this, watching gas prices and food prices go up almost while you're staring at the box. I saw gas prices, like I said, go up 10 cents last week. One week? I've never seen that in my whole life. So I found myself, I caught myself worrying about having enough money and I had to repent for worrying and get myself together. But y'all, it's natural when things are going up so fast. So unless you're an extremely wealthy person, if you're wealthy, I guess you don't have to worry about it. But so if you do find yourself afraid or worried, just repent and give that to the Lord. Okay. But you know what? When you are faithful, God has the most amazing ways of just showing up and providing for you. Remember the widow of Zarephath? Elijah had been chillaxing at the brook Cherith, where his accommodations included morning and evening delivery of takeout. One day as the brook is drying up, the Lord speaks to him and tells him to head for Zarephath so he can continue to be fed. So the widow of Zarephath and her son are gathering sticks when Elijah comes riding into town. Elijah asks her for some water and some bread. So the poor widow tells him all she has is a tiny handful of meal and a couple of drops of oil, And she's going to make a tiny cake to share with her son as their last meal before they starve to death. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. So Elijah was saying, Give me a portion of what you have saved first, and then take care of yourself and your son with what's left, and God will bless you. And then Elijah gave her a word from God. 
For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. So, how did Elijah know he was going to eat at Zarephath? Because, First Kings 17, 9 told him, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. That's what God told him. He said, I've already told her to feed you. Elijah needed to know there was some kind of food there, because I read somewhere that Zarephath was like 75 miles from the brook Cherith. That's quite a trek on foot, y'all, and during a famine to boot. So, what a story. Somehow, in a time when people did not commune with Almighty God like we do, that widow knew God or had favor with God, and he had told her to feed Elijah. Then Elijah blesses her, and her oil and flour last for the entire famine, feeding the woman, her son, and we don't know who all else. Elijah, we don't know who else. Not long after that, the widow's son died. But she ran and got Elijah, who prayed intensely for him, and God raised him again. So, just how... Did this famine-busting favor come about? That widow was wise enough to put giving and obedience to God above her own needs. That's called sacrificial giving. So today, I was moving some stuff around in my dining room, and I had some extra food that I was trying to decide what to do with. Thinking about the church food pantry, because, you know, winter's coming up, and a lot of times people are in need. And I was praying to the Lord about it, and I said, Lord, The bottom line is, if I'm scared about what's coming, I will try to hoard. But if I'm not scared, I'll give. I'll sow. In the end, what's coming is severe and nobody but you can get us through it anyway. And he answered me. I wasn't expecting that. I was just kind of, you know, walking around talking to him. And he said, many will get saved in this time when they see my provision. I will give more provision to those who trust me. Let me repeat that to be sure you get it. Many will get saved in this time when they see my provision. I will give more provision to those who trust me. Who are the people who trust him? The people who share what they have. The people who give out of their own need. Those who trust God will not hoard. They will share what they have with the other people in need. Now and in that time. Corey Ten Boom. Y'all remember me talking about Corey Ten Boom? What a woman of God. I cannot wait to meet her in heaven. She was in a Nazi death camp. Her entire family died in that camp. She alone came out, and the way she came out was miraculous. If you have not read her books, I highly recommend them. They're little teeny tiny books, but they are so good. They're out on Amazon and a gazillion other places. So Corey Ten Boom tells of a time in the German death camp Ravensbrück during World War II. She had smuggled her Bible and a small bottle of liquid vitamins into her barracks. Her sister Betsy was sick and growing sicker, but she demanded that Corey first give a dose of vitamins to all the other sick in their barracks before she would accept any. Corey tells that a strange thing was happening. The vitamin bottle was continuing to produce drops. It scarcely seemed possible so small a bottle, so many doses a day. Now, in addition to Betsy, a dozen others on their peer were taking it. She said, my instinct was always to hoard it. Betsy was growing so very weak, but the others were ill as well. It was hard to say no to eyes that burned with fever, hands that shook with chill. I tried to save it for the very weakest, but even those soon numbered 15, 20, and 25. And still, every time I tilted the little bottle, a drop appeared at the tip of the glass stopper. It just couldn't be. I held it up to the light trying to see how much was left, but the dark brown glass was too thick to see through. There was a woman in the Bible, Betsy said, whose oil jar was never empty. She turned to it in the book of Kings, the story of the poor widow of Zarephath, who gave Elijah a room in her home. The jar of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the works of Jehovah, which he spoke by Elijah. Well, but... Wonderful things happen all through the Bible. It was one thing to believe that such things were possible thousands of years ago, another to have it it happen now to us, this very day. And yet it happened this day, and the next, and the next, until an odd little group of spectators 
stood around watching the drops fall onto the daily rations of bread. Many nights I lay awake in the shower of straw dust from the mattress above, trying to fathom the marvel of supply lavished upon us. Maybe, I whispered to Betsy, only a molecule of tea really gets through that little pinhole, and in the air it expands. I heard her soft laughter in the dark. Don't try too hard to explain it, Corey. Just accept it as a surprise from a father who loves you. That's from Corey Ten Boom's book, The Hiding Place. Also, do y'all remember the story of the widow with two mites? My friend Dela, who is right now writing a curriculum for a Bible study the Lord wants her to start, gave me the best version of the widow with two mites I had ever heard. She said, Those mites were her meat and her bread. What she dropped into that box was her heart. She was giving all she had to say, Thank you, God. He had sustained her. And it rang with a sound unlike the others. And that was what got the attention of the king. So if you need to get the attention of the king, give from your heart. Say thank you by giving courageously, proving to him that you do believe, that you do trust him to provide for you and those you love no matter what comes. Recently, I was in a time of extreme stress. I'm not kidding when I say extreme, y'all. And I really, I mean, it was so bad my hair started falling out. Does that tell you anything? I really needed God to lighten my load. So I went out on a limb. I decided to give sacrificially because I know the power of giving because I needed to get the attention of my king. So that week I gave a double tithe. That's the only time I've ever done that. But I was desperate with more than one situation I was praying for help with and pleading with the Lord to lessen the stress I was under. I'm very happy to tell you he did just that. He lightened the stress And he solved several make it or break it problems for me so I could again see the light at the end of the tunnel. Praise his holy name. So how can we pray now that we're staring down the barrel at the end of time? Let's keep these things in mind. God always welcomes his children to come before him and ask for what we need. Be specific. We can ask for and receive mercy for ourselves and our families in what is coming. We can and should pray to be counted worthy to escape those things that are to come. Pray your loved ones will too. I pray over both my children. I pray over my grandchildren. I pray over my sister and her family. That's the only family that I have left. All my other family is deceased. But you should pray for them. Pray for them to be counted worthy. to. We don't want anybody left behind in this, y'all. And we certainly do not want any of them lost where they go to hell for all eternity. We need to pray for them every day. So we can and should pray to be counted worthy to escape those things that are to come. Pray for our loved ones. In the time of Noah, Noah was allowed to take his family with him into the ark. In Lot's time, the Lord sent angels to gather up Lot and lead him and his family to safety. In our time, God is moving many to safety even now. Some of you are already in safe places. Some of you have emailed me and said, how come God's not moving me? You may already be in a safe place. And keep in mind that if God can protect three Hebrew men in the fire of the furnace they were in that was turned up seven times hotter, he didn't move them. He can protect you right where you're at. And that may be a testimony to someone around you that you've prayed for in itself. The word of God is both for our provision and our protection. Use it. I will be giving examples in the upcoming End Time Spiritual Warfare series. God, please help me find the time to write that on exactly how you do that. Y'all pray for me because I don't even know how I'm going to work that into my schedule, but I'm determined to do it because y'all need it. We can give a special offering from our hearts when we really need to get our king's attention. That intense worship and fasting are all good for calling the Lord's special attention to your situation. I'm going to read you a story called Letting Go of the Branch. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. Trusting in God is fine, as long as it is something you believe he can do. It's funny that sometimes we find ourselves content to let God handle the ordinary things in life, like giving us an opportunity to do well on a job interview or score well on a test. But when it really comes to the hard things, the things that really seem impossible and we have little, if any, faith that they will ever happen, 
We are often tempted to trust our own means rather than give the problem up to God. Being content to wait on the Lord for the impossible is something that most Christians just have a hard time doing. Patience is not really our strong suit, is it, y'all? Why are we so reluctant to give God the impossible things and then sit back and wait for an answer? We know that God has done the impossible in the past. He created something from nothing. How impossible can you get? Even the simpler things like parting the waters of the Red Sea and sending manna and quail to his children in the desert were accomplished without so much as a bat of a holy eyelash. Yet when it comes to our impossible, the things that have us so stimmied that we are at a total loss for a solution, we often find ourselves thinking that we know God could do it, but it seems so far-fetched that he would do it. So we fight on alone, trusting that somehow luck or pluck will get the job done. Perhaps it's just we feel we don't want to bother God with stuff that's hard. Maybe it's just we feel foolish asking for really big things. More likely, however, it's because we have a schedule for things to happen and the hard things, the impossible things, we need those to be gotten out of the way quickly so we can go on with our lives. We know that God has a solution for every problem. The problem is we often find ourselves reluctant to match our schedules with his timetable. How true is that, y'all? It's like the man who fell off a cliff but managed to grab a tree limb on the way down. He looks upward and yells, is anybody up there? And then he hears a voice. I am here. I am the Lord. Do you believe me? Yes, Lord, I believe. I really believe, the man says earnestly, but I can't hang on much longer. That's all right, was the Lord's reply. If you really believe you have nothing to worry about, I will save you. Just let go of the branch. A moment of pause went by, and then, is anybody up there? (laughs) I love that. Zechariah found out the hard way that God answers prayer as long as we are willing to leave the hard things, the impossible things, totally up to him. He and his wife Elizabeth had prayed for a child for a long time, and now they were elderly, and her womb was shut up. Yet, she bore a child because of God's willingness to grant the impossible. If only we will relegate the impossible to him in the first place. God is willing and able to reach down and make the impossible happen in our lives as well. Simply, we need to believe he is willing. And most importantly, we need to be willing to endure what might be a weight in order to see the fruits of our prayers. When faced with the impossible, it is often best to let go of our reluctance to trust in ourselves and give God the space he needs to work the miracles he is so willing to do in our lives. I hope this podcast has been a help to you. I hope it has eased your mind and your heart a little, that it has increased your faith that even in these very intense times, our mighty God is still on the throne. And he is just as willing to do a miracle today as he was in Jesus' time, as long as we are just as willing to believe him too. Thanks for listening. Jesus bless you. Y'all have a great week. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Just Praise Him Radio. You can contact me by mail at my new address, JPH Inc., Glenda Lomax, P.O. Box 60, Glencoe, Arkansas 72539, or by email at JPH Today at gmail.com JPH is not affiliated with any nonprofit organization church or denomination What is in store for the once great and mighty nation of America in these end times What is the living God saying to the people of America now What could possibly be in store for a nation that once trusted in God, but has changed its path from following in the living God's ways to now removing Him from everything and walking the other way? In the book, No Longer Mind, you will find all the messages to America collected in one place in chronological order. No Longer Mind, Messages to an Unrepentant Nation is now available in print at wingsofprophecy.com in the bookstore tab. Get your copy of No Longer Mind today.
Does your life feel like it's falling apart around you? Are multiple things going wrong all at once? Does it seem all your comforts have been stripped away? You may have entered the wilderness. Wilderness experiences are often times of great discomfort and lack. Every Christian must pass through the desert on the way to their promised land. Find out how to go from surviving to thriving by partnering with God as He leads you in the path that will strengthen your faith and prepare you to step into your destiny. The Wilderness Companion will help you find out why you have been led into the wilderness. Find out the biggest hindrances to receiving the provision you need in the wilderness. Find out what the seven temptations of the wilderness are. Learn how to partner with God in His purposes for you in the desert seasons. Get your copy of The Wilderness Companion today. The Wilderness Companion by Glinda Lomax on Amazon.com in print, Kindle, or audiobook. If you ask anyone you know what the most difficult experience of their life has been, many will answer about a time of betrayal. All those called to walk the narrow path will at some point encounter Judas. How will you respond? Do you know how to recognize Judas when he shows up in your life? Can you keep Judas from bringing destruction to your life and ministry? How can you minimize what Judas cost you? Can you pass the test of absolute betrayal? Get your copy of The Judas Test, available in print and new audiobook, The Judas Test by Glenda Lomax, available now on Amazon.com. Sold out for 30 pieces of silver? In Exodus 21:32, it is the price of a dead slave. In Leviticus 27, 2-7, it is the price of a live one. Jesus was sold for the price of a bondservant. Precious Jesus, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, why did Judas sell his friend out so cheap?